So it gives me great pleasure to introduce Arika Oka, Director of the Black Cultural Archives, who is going to talk about the Civic Archivist. Good evening, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Let me know, Gillian, if I can be heard. Yeah, perfect, perfect. Thank you so much, Gillian, for inviting me to speak tonight. And thank you for, to LSE. It's really, really great to be part of this series. And um, obviously I wish we could have done it in person. That was how we'd originally envisaged um, the, the, the talk going, but hopefully we will get to revisit it again after the pandemic. So I was first approached for this talk a year ago in or around Black History Month 2019, which is the most busy time for Black cultural archives for clear reasons. And so I think we, re, we, we then talked about the, the talk being in March 2020, which is when the first lockdown threw us all up in the air and the world as we experienced it, as we expected it, as we understood it, changed drastically. So here we are now in lockdown number two, but this one is markedly different, we've adapted. And it is exhausting, it's like being in the last mile of a marathon and being made to run another, but here we are. What can we look back at from our ancestors' experiences and our shared uh, experiences to our shared histories to help us cope? This isn't the first pandemic to bring Western society to a reckoning, it's not the first disaster. Our documentary history and heritage is preserved and collected in archives could hold answers to what will happen next. 2020 isn't the worst year in the history of Britain. I talk about Britain specifically here because as we know or should know, much worse events and crises affect other parts of the global society more deeply and in more prolonged and irreconcilable ways daily than the coronavirus crisis is affecting Britain. And some of those crises, perhaps many of them, have a causal relationship to the history of Britain and its role in the world, in how we begin to try to make sense of the now that we find ourselves in, and how the now we find ourselves in relates to the reality of others. Archives as tools. And so I'm going to be talking about the idea of the archive as a tool, as the archivist, the civic archivist, as a way of framing the work that we do as archivists. Um, I personally, I'm a registered archivist. It's a bit like being a chartered accountant, probably. Um, it's, a, it's a, a certain level that you can reach in your profession where you start to have a reflective practice and start to share your practice. And I think that's quite key to the idea of a civic archivist. It's something that I'm very interested in exploring. So I hope you'll, Bear with me as I talk a little bit through my thoughts around the civic archivist tonight. I do see the archivist as the gateway to the archives, so the human gateway to the archives, the archivist as an interpreter of the archives. And this is controversial because for decades, the professional training of archivists has rejected a role of interpreter the archon of the archivist, which if, if anyone goes to archives talks and conferences, um, you might be familiar with Derrida. So the archon of the archivist, which via Derrida's influential essay, Archive Beaver, identified as the mode of control which the archivist has over the narrative trajectory of publicly understood history, is something that professionally trained archivists do not associate with their practice. As much as the public may interpret archivists' role as gatekeeper, and especially when it comes to the history of art and contemporary artists' experiences of the archive and how they understand the way that archives work, archivists have rejected this idea of gatekeeper, of interpreter. Archivists should be impartial, neutral. Nothing of the archivist should intrude into their work. The archive must remain unsullied by human touch, free of bias, uninterpreted. The archive must be the preserved ruins of the past. An acropolis of what happened then, when. But this is in fact an immense power of archives in so much as it is only partially true. So if you're a researcher, using archives as a researcher is a thrill. As an uninterpreted cohort of papers, they are the physical representation of the undiscovered country. It's still possible for researchers to become explorers that discover 
in the colonial sense, discover previously unknown knowledges. Archives are kind of communist in that quality. Everyone that uses them is a curator of their own experience. Museum curators interpret collections for display, tell specific narratives and chronologies, arguably. Archivists in the researchers' imagination merely retrieve boxes for the researchers, whoever they are, to make discoveries and for the researchers to create new discursive journeys. So where does this then lead to that proactive role for the archivist that I'm suggesting? The archivist is cast by their nature as a passive patrician for the collections they safeguard. If the researchers are the animators of the archive, the researchers then are the ones that control our public understanding of the past and that which archives can teach us. I argue that archivists control what is kept, and this is not a new argument. There's, there's decades of research around and um, the, the, new, the supposed neutrality or impartiality of archivists. I argue that archivists influence what is seen that archivists can conceal and reveal, that it is our duty, in fact, to better understand the power that we wield and therefore to deliberately use it, moving from the impartiality that after decades of archival theories have continually already disproven this impartiality to a proactive responsibility as members of society that have a deep and abiding responsibility to service society, to expose, combat and correct injustices, to fulfil the civic function that we inherit alongside the responsibility to preserve the past. So if you'll indulge me, I think it's perhaps useful for me to outline a little of my own career journey at this point. I'm now the Managing Director of Black Cultural Archives, BCA, but my relationship with history as a, as a subject is rooted in my identity as a Yoruba Yorkshire woman brought up partly in Hull in, the northern, in northern England, partly in Bauchi in northern Nigeria, in my education being split between the Nigerian system, in which I learned to speak Hausa, which I've now forgotten, and the geography of Africa, which I have now forgotten, and the British system in which I learned that the history of black people was rescued by the abolitionist and proud son of Hull, which is uh, where I'm from, William Wilberforce. My social conscience development traced through my decision to go to the University of Birmingham, which was partly because of its history as one of the first civic or red brick universities established without the, uh, the college basis and admitting students historically in principle from a range of backgrounds and for the study and research of engineering and medicine rather than theology and humanities. I went to study a humanities degree, so obviously they, they moved on from that initial, initial uh, purpose. Initially, Birmingham University was one of the universities that was founded on the idea of real world practical topics to be taught. Um, the civic university movement is based around industrial cities, a product of the industrial age of Britain, and was so intrinsically tied to the global trading ecology in which the British Empire sat for a while in the centre. So for me, as a product of the British Empire, arguably, going to university in Birmingham, studying for my history degree there was certainly formative. Birmingham is projected to be one of the first UK cities to achieve no overall ethnic majority by 2024, just around the corner. Everyone there will be BAME, technically. So that fact certainly gives some context as to why that acronym is so problematic and of such limited practical use. The University of Birmingham, uh, sorry, the University of Birmingham is also the university at which the late Stuart Hall, Jamaican born cultural theorist and educator was a director of the Centre for Contemporary Cultural Studies, a research centre that actively investigated the modes and means, the development and impact and the whys of cultural phenomena as relating to individuals within society. History within these sociological cultural studies is not only a chronology or backdrop for nostalgic remembrance, but is also an engine for change and an incubator for the future. So this is something that I think is quite key to the idea of the civic archivist. After being at university in Birmingham, I went on to become a registrar of births, deaths and marriages in Leeds. <laughs> 
this job meant meeting everyone in Leeds at some point or having the opportunity to meet them. From the traveller communities, birth and death registrations to wealthy country club weddings, being a registrar means being a genuinely passive observer of human life at moments of civil significance. I was a registrar when citizenship ceremonies were introduced. I was a registrar when civil partnerships for same-sex couples only were introduced. When I was a registrar, and I believe this should, uh, it's probably still the case, the registers, which have those uh, registration elements in, so the births, deaths and marriage registers, going back to the early days of registration, were still kept at the local offices. You could get a reprint, a certified copy, of your own birth certificate from those original registers. You could also use them to trace back ancestry. I first learned my paleography or handwriting reading skills in the back room of the register office, going through the handwritten indexes, breathing in the iron rich ink smell from the aged paper stock. The ink was archival quality. It didn't fade, it stayed. I still remember the way that those records and those registers changed over time, from the way that causes of death were described to the type of work that people wrote as their occupation, from the frequency uh, in the older registers of woolen mill accidents being the causes of death to the frequency of causes of death related to asbestos. So Leeds, if you didn't know, was one of the cities in, in, in England where children, well, where adults now remember playing as children with asbestos in the street as though it was snow. And you see that in the death registers in Leeds after a certain point, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. So you can also trace uh, literacy in Leeds in those registers from the majority of people being only able to sign their name of a map to the majority of people being able to write their own names from the paternalism of the original data collected to the inclusion gradually of space for women to have their professions recorded from the first range of ways in which Mohammed or Begum or Kaur were spelt in the birth and marriage registers to the gradual standardization of those spellings in more recent times. So these are records of social significance. They track the development of Leeds, its people, and their journey through time together. So it's all of these experiences that introduced me to the idea of archives. It's a profession that brings together human life now with our pasts and our futures. It's a profession in which you can curate an exhibition, you can work silently indexing, and you can, can help and you can help someone conduct their own research all in one day. So it's an active profession. It's a bridge. I went back to Birmingham after being a registrar to work with the Connecting Histories project. In those days, Black Cultural Archives, BCA, was still fundraising for its eventual home at One Windrush Square, where it is now. Connecting Histories was trying to reconnect the collections with the communities they were made by, to reprogram the relationships and perceptions that kept the Library of Birmingham as it was then, this was the old library building, the best used library in Europe. But the archives within this best used library in Europe were still used by an unchanging core group of people who were brave enough to figure out how to find it, how to get into it, how to find what they wanted to see, how to request it, etc, etc. The Connecting Histories project was seminal in its time. A group of researchers worked alongside archivists to catalogue and open up avenues into the collections. The archive creators, where they were still alive, worked with us too. So it was a kind of co-curation um, as far as we could um, project. And that's where I met and got to know Van Lee Burke, who is one of the preeminent Black British photographers and one of the progenitors of Black British documentary photography. Van Lee's practice was an archival practice. He wanted to document the Caribbean community in Birmingham. One of his most well-known works is Boy With Flag, in which a young boy leans on his bicycle, which has a union flag flying from it. And I will just see if I can share that um, image with you. This is Boy With Flag. 
So the boy is black, dressed in the 70s fashion of the time, utterly relaxed and clearly in one of the landscaped municipal parks. It's a photograph that epitomizes something about the spirit of the time and about the relationship between the generations of what is now styled as the Windrush and their English homes. Stanley noted that in his collection of photography from that time, he also took photos of people with dogs. He had a theory, oops, hang on, that if people get pet dogs, that means they're staying, that they have given away thoughts of returning to the Caribbean islands, that Birmingham was now home. The boy with flag picturing a younger generation from the, from the adults that travelled as part of Windrush showed that for those people who had grew up in Birmingham, it's actually a foregone conclusion that Birmingham was home. Stanley's photographic and artistic practice are much wider than the photos I've described. They include shots of Africa Liberation Day events. Uh, he travelled around South Africa with Nelson Mandela. Uh, he photographed in Liverpool, in London. Stanley's view on the Black, British and African descent diaspora experience understands African descent history as a diaspora history but his collection almost went up in flames. When I was cataloguing it, some of the prints and the ephemera were still stained with smoke and still smelt of the fire. Perhaps he, he'd begun despairing of the collection ever being made available as a public resource. Anyone collecting it, anyone making it accessible, perhaps he'd given up hope on the project of preserving his community's history. Um, it seems he had set a bonfire of some of his collection. And it was Pete James, who was a photography curator at the Library of Birmingham, who had uh, intervened with family to stop the, 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 the destruction of the collection. And this intervention has made research possible. There are dissertations, there are theses now based on Vanley's collection. There have been major gallery exhibitions, think pieces, articles written on it. His collection is a key part of our national heritage, our national story. My role in this is, is small. Obviously, I just catalogue part of the collection. The archive services, Birmingham Archive Services role was utilitarian. It provided a space for the collection to be stored and made accessible. The barriers remained really for Van Lee's vision of a collection co-owned and used by the people it's from and of. Barriers of perception, barriers in reality. Passive archive and a passive archivist would have allowed Van Lee's collection to go up in flames. I mean, archives are the detritus of history in some respects. They're only what survives, what survives and is findable. Without a catalogue, the archive is unnavigable. The tools we use still to catalog collections are based on principles that were set in a previous world, a world in which a collection of the nature of families, um, his, his collection is, is more than photographs, it's quite, quite uh, entertaining, it has plastic bags in it, has photocopied flyers. These provide valuable evidence of black presence and industry and community and life, but, even at the time when we were cataloguing it, we were, we were struggling to, to figure out how it could be seen as more than ephemeral within the cataloguing structures that we had. Um, how could this, you know, this plastic bag uh, for a, you know, a Jamaican patty shop or what have you be, be, have research value? So the cataloguing practices archivists use uh, can be seem sometimes to be based on a disassociative, passionless type of categorization and listing established in a context quite different to the one that we operate in globally now and sanitized to be general enough to fill it all collections. Archivists are taught to respect the fonds, meaning the provenance, the source, not to change original order, not to impose interpretation. However, respecting the source in the civic sense may sometimes mean more than forcing a sporadic, diverse, sprawling collection to fit the still framework of the catalogue. So I want to just quickly share my screen just one more time to show you um, another approach to the catalogue. 
Okay. So this is the catalogue of the artist John Latham's archive at Flat Time House, and it posits a different approach, one in which, although the basic catalogue behind the scenes may be very familiar, the experience that a researcher has when encountering the catalogue is very individual. There are three ways to enter the archive, as different characters from Dostoevsky's The Brothers, Karamas Karamasov, <laughs> The online archive is organized in three parallel sections, so all documents are accessible from every section. So choosing a section will not affect the content. However, each section offers different search tools to retrieve content. These tools are inspired, as I say, by the brothers Karamazov, um, Mitya, Ivan and Alyosha. Please forgive my pronunciation. So Leif, these are these are three brothers, three characters that Leif had made reference to in his work. So Mitya appears to offer a random selection of documents from the archive in the form of a slideshow. Ivan is a highly structured index of terms from controlled vocabularies, allowing faceted searching. And Alyosha is an intuitive search tool, which is based on Leif's time bases as described using sound. So I will just click on a couple so you can see how it kind of works, if the internet will. Right, so this is Mitya and it shows a randomized shuffling through as a slideshow. So by the next one. Ivan. Perhaps this is a bit more um, how we might be used to searching through an archive. So we've got index terms that can pull up, you know, what, whatever they're indexed with. Third and youngest brother. And see, you can select different sort of... I don't know if you can hear it. Okay, I'll stop share now. That just gives you an idea of a, a slightly different approach to cataloging. Uh, in this in this approach, the archivists have understood that a catalog is not binary. Its function doesn't start and end with archival description. Instead, it's a discursive means of interaction with the researcher, whoever they may be. Maybe they're a young person trying to find inspiration for uh, a, 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 a piece of schoolwork or a YouTube video, or they're a creative who is looking for inspiration for, for their own artwork, or they're an academic writing a journal article or a book. So the archivist, therefore, must wear the hat of investigator when they're cataloging, discovering the original order, provenance, or, fun, or funds, or taking a functional appraisal approach, and then go further by performing but go further than performing a passive compliant function in the sorting of the collection into the elusive sanitized order. They must also take on the role of the therapist of an unknown client. What routes can the archivists create into the catalog for the potential users of the collection? What trails can the archivists lay? And what sort of welcome can the archivist create? So I think welcome is, is, in, is incredibly important to the idea of a civic archivist, an archivist that understands and operates within a social framework, societal front framework. So the welcome that is created for archive users, both potential and actual, is key. This is central to the role of the civic archivist. But the understanding of the archivist as an individual working to promote and nurture civic values is key to the welcome that we prepare for archive users. But in this, I must reflect on BCA, my cultural archives. There are a small number of archive services in the UK and Europe which specifically collect archive material that relates to and comes from the experiences of people of African descent born or raised in the British or European parts of the African diaspora. And in London, we had the George Padmore Institute founded in 1999, uh, sorry, 1991. There's the Huntley Archives at London Met 
the Institute of Racial Relations, which is the earliest, I think, founded in 1958. And then there's BCA, which was conceived in 1981 and constituted in 1995. And these are the collections <clears throat> and archive services with the longest running remit for documenting and preserving specifically the, the British Black experience. So these collections and archive services share commonalities in how they were founded and by whom. A network of black academics, creatives, activists, educators, and politically active individuals were the starting point for addressing what had been identified as a lack of recognition of the black heritage of the UK, and specifically the contribution of black communities and people to the British identity and society. The swell of post-war activism and community building that prompted the creation of centres of study for black history, these centres of study, was led by people who had lived through the Second World War, arguably the, uh, the last great crisis before this pandemic that we're in now, and witnessed the changing social dynamics of the immediate post-war period. So this period in black British history is punctuated by the arrival and return of British black citizens from the British overseas territories and colonies. The period is named after one of the ships on one of the forms of transport in which people in this case of this ship predominantly from the Caribbean arrived, the SS Empire Windrush. <clears throat> the migration of people from the Caribbean, especially people of African descent, back to what imperial education systems framed as the mother country was a turning point in post-war Britain's cultural, philosophical and ethnic diversity. But of course, wasn't the first time that Britain was formed by migration and not the first time that British history was influenced by people of African descent, of course. But that the mainstream archival narrative and collections in Britain did not and do not reflect Britain's diverse and global inheritance has been cited as part of the wider whitewashing of Britishness, contributing to racist stereotypes, educational attainment gaps, perpetuation of social inequalities, and frankly, unbalanced policy making. Contributing to the archival record are the sites in which Black archival history are collected and preserved. Beyond the general incidence of people of colour within wider institutional collecting locally and nationally, black communities and intellectuals perceive that taking ownership of black history would mean ownership and collecting of their own archives. And so this is where we come to BCA. BCA is today the Black Lead Archive that has been able to secure a permanent building. So it's almost 40 years old now, and most of those 40 years were spent trying to secure a home, a HQ, a building in which we could operate from. And that was done by collective action. That was not done by trying to wait for the ruins of the archive. That was a proactive civic endeavor. BCA traces its origins directly from community action in direct response to specific incidents that highlighted that need. And the act, this act of self-help expanded into the creation of what BCA's founders called an archive museum. So it contains material deposited by members of the community that evidence and paint a more comprehensive picture of black presence in Britain. There was a 2003 report created by Black Cultural Archives and the University of Middlesex that observed that through the 1980s, many attempts were made unsuccessfully to attract interest from mainstream museums and archives to give moral and other support to the idea of creating a Black cultural archives. And so the network of community activists absolutely had to, had to do for self, lobbying the Greater London Authority, the London Borough of Lambeth, and they each gave foundational financial support. There was also financial support from the National Lottery in the form of the Heritage Lottery Fund. Um, and the University of Middlesex worked with the BCA Collective to establish an idea of what the collections were and a way forward. So it's really been a collective effort. Hmm. So BCA now is a space by and for its community as well as for society at large. It's able to attract a demographic of researchers that includes a high proportion of people under 35 years old and a high proportion of researchers who are African descent. 
and these demographics are unusual for archive services. Is it possible, for example, for a hypothetical research library within a venerable historic British institution, which for decades focused only on admitting researchers with academic references and institutional credentials to now convincingly attract a younger and more ethnically diverse demographic? Do they have the correct welcome? Reputations, assumptions, visual cues, all play a role in how welcome you or I feel when we enter shops, institutions, businesses, even schools. And that's even more so for archives, which still occupy a hinterland in the public perception of being dusty. Even after all of the work in popularizing that TV programs such as Who Do You Think You Are promote, there is still something arcane and specialist about getting through the door of an archive. Even where archives have glass doors so that people can see into the reading rooms, that can actually heighten the sense of a hallowed space. The reading room at the Stanley Kubrick Archive at the University of the Arts London has an amazing glass wall construction that evokes the futuristic design aesthetic of Kubrick's films. The glass mists up when the reading room is closed, but can this performative effect, which is very cool, and in keeping with the collection, have an effect of making the reading room feel like an elite and hermetically sealed space. So even, even I, after becoming a qualified archivist, having had numerous work meetings with the British Library and having used its collections during two of my uh, degrees, felt intimidated when I last attended as a researcher for an, uh, for an article I was writing. I should have felt at home and I was treated very well by the staff, but there is still some, there's still something about how the welcome is presented. And at BCA, despite our welcome being of a very different tone and nature, we too suffer from that rarefied association that archives hold in the popular imagination. We too have only a small part of our footfall visitors to One Windrush Square, where we're based, venture up to or have an awareness of the existence of our reading room. So archivists can't solve all of these issues. Some of them are to do with the assumptions and the work that the designers of our spaces and the parent bodies within whose spaces the archive sits have about the collections. So in the new library of Birmingham, not the one that I worked in, which has been knocked down, in the new library of Birmingham, the archive sits in a kind of fondant fancy style treasure box at the very top of the building. And you ascend through knowledge via the central escalators, which is such a beautiful concept to reach the apex of the archives, but it does make it feel like an exclusive experience, an experience that only a certain few may get to enjoy. Uh, at BCA, we're filming uh, some video at the moment um, because we obviously the collections are locked down, so we're creating video content about our collections. And our filmmaker is trying to insist on an ethereal sound bed for the film to heighten the sense of uh, rarefied atmosphere and esotericism. And archivists must guide against these actions, which are flattering, of course, to the profession and do of course support the truth that the collections are irreplaceable and, and highly valuable. But the civic archivist must understand that the vast majority of collections value stems immediately from their use. Archives must not become ornamental, must not become nostalgic. They must always be tools in society's growth. One of the founders of Black Cultural Archives, Len Garrison, said of the motivation to create the dreamt of archive museum. We need our own archives where important acts and achievements of the past, which are now scattered or pushed into the margins of European history can be assembled, where facts now presented as negative can be represented from our point of view as positive factions in our liberation. This archive dream is of an activist archive, an archive that has a powerful function, but it also in its meaning 
captures the essential nature of all archives, from the business records of a spoon manufacturer in Wolverhampton to the personal family papers of a landed family. Archives are not ruins of history after all, they are the soul of history. They cannot only be what has survived the past, they must be what we need to know and carry with us from the past. They have the seeds of future possibilities within them and answers to questions we may not yet be ready for. So I have a, I have a little bit more to say, but I think I'm going to um, pause uh, soon because I think I've probably talked to her a bit too long already. But I do want to say that archives are civic tools able to support the well-being of society, to foster justice, to protect social values, to correct injustice and they help us understand ourselves. So archivists then have the opportunity to understand their duty of care and, of the, and their duty of creating access to the archives as part of the civic virtue in which archivists proactively investigate and engage with collections and society collections and society as part of a continuum of duty, each inseparable from the other. So with that, I think I'll pause and um, perhaps we, we, we have a discussion. Well, thank you very much. That was wonderful. Lots of food for thought there. Um, so now we're, we're able to take questions. Um, and we do have one question already in the chat box and it's from Kate Jarman. Would you, Kate, would you like to unmute yourself and ask your question? Hold on, sorry, yeah. can you hear me? Can, yes. yeah. Yeah, so, um, I mean, I, I, I've kind of, um, coming from a, a point of view of the fact that I, I'm an archivist, uh, I work in what is uh, very typical of being a, a very under-resourced archive, and for us, the imperative of access is to get stuff catalogued. Um, I really like that uh, someone's helpfully said that, that the artist you were talking about was called John Latham. I really like that that catalog that you were showing us. But that seems like quite a resource intensive process to to develop something like that. How do you balance that kind of the imperative to to just make it, make people aware that that the stuff exists? the kind of just more 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 product less process the, the, that just getting getting catalogs out there to the standard model and making something which is welcoming and representative of, of maybe a kind of non-institutional collection thanks kate yeah, absolutely and um as you know um I feel your pain. I've been a solo archivist in services before. I've worked for organisations with, with tons of funding and organisations with zero funding, local authority archives as well. Um, running BCA has given me a, a, a slightly different perspective on, 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 on that though from when I was a solo archivist at Rombert. Um, because BCA is an independent charity, so we don't receive any grant and aid funding. Um, any funding that we receive, we we apply for um, from from public bodies, at least. Um, so, and and, and as, as I mentioned, BCA grew from a collective action, so it grew from voluntary action. So, unlike um, some some of our of bigger charities, it never had an endowment, which means that financially BCA is always, 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 always fundraising for anything at all that it does. Um, and so our our motto for 2020, um, before the pandemic even happened, was get someone else to pay for it. So that's that's one thing, which is it's possibly a bit of a, a facetious thing if you're in a uh, in a situation where you haven't got any kind of fundraising. Um, um, support at BCA we don't have a fundraiser but we, we still are able to to kind of uh, make fun uh, make funding happen but, um, I do understand from my own experience that that's not quite the approach that can help everybody so that's one that's one thing that's one approach and obviously for, for John Latham's archive I presented it as a provocation in a way because it's it's a very artist led um, a, a very artist way to approach an archive. I think it's it's a useful provocation for us, and I think it's something that we can, um, whether we 
we probably wouldn't work towards that model ourselves um, in 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 specific collections because it won't work for everything. I think there is something about being able to question and and challenge what we have received, our received wisdom about how cataloging and access to collections can work. Yeah, absolutely more product, less process, gets more catalog records out there and into the in, into into um, into public consumption into, and into researchers' hands. Um, and that's that's super valuable, but I think it does start to miss out and erode the possibility of including different kinds of researchers to the collections. I mean, so many people find archive catalogues to be completely impenetrable and to figure out a way around the catalog is, is, is impossible for a lot of people. So I think that maybe it's something that a piece of work that as a profession, we actually might need to start gathering around and not just leaving it up to individual archivists and individual services to try and figure out themselves. But yeah, I, I absolutely, I, I proposed Latham's archive as a kind of provocation because it is, is I find it really fascinating. And I, I don't know myself how we would how we would use that at BCA. But I think it's a it's a really interesting um, stepping off point. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we've got a question from Kathleen. Kathleen, would you like to unmute yourself? Um, hi there. Hi. Um, yeah. So yeah, I was just asking about um, you know we're stripping back on the kind of barriers, I guess. This is what I'm hearing um, to a certain extent um, in Ulrich's talk, um, in terms of the way people use and access archives. And um, I'm a researcher here, just starting to work on a project at Northumbria University, Northumbria University with three BAME organizations. It's a public engagement project, AHRC funded. And we're at the start of just You know, just putting together, collating um, some of the material that's been around with these organizations um, for 20, 25 years, you know, these um, BAME community cultural organizations. And so um, as somebody who's worked in the museum for 15 years, I understand the sort of institutional barriers that, um, you know, that can be faced, but also the kind of language and terminology that is used, even still in archival processes. And as much as we can think about the kind of social behavior and welcome, welcoming attitudes and the kind of architecture of the space around archiving and um, being the social, social archive, archive, archivist experience, um, to what extent do you think language and terminology is a barrier um, or could be less exclusive as part of this process? Yeah, absolutely. I think that is, I think that, thank you. I, I think, thank you so much, Kathleen. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, language is, 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 because it's almost a shorthand that we use to talk to each other. Um, one thing that, so I'm, I'm kind of I'm going to answer or respond to that a little bit sideways, if, if you don't mind. So at BCA, one of the things that has been a challenge for the organization, for the charity, has been being able to operate um, as a legitimate archive, as, a rec as an archive that's recognized as an archive by other established services, right? So not to be um, always recognized as a community archive, but for it to be recognized as a professional archive. And so this is really important to us to be able to access funding and support from the local council and to get our building. There was a lot of those decades of trying to get the building were based around professionalizing the practice and professionalizing the collection. Um, and there's something in that process, which I think um, was so necessary but at the same time um, began to almost distance BCA a little bit from its own roots. Um, so, there's, so, there's a, so there's something there around now that we're in that position of being able to speak the language that the rest of the 
professional heritage sector understands that we're actually, we have that kind of gravitas now um, and we're able to kind of push back on it more. So there's something around um, being able to advocate, right, um, for um, being able to advocate in order to be able to make that pushback, but for changing, for, for, for grassroots and community archives and organisations that are coming up, um, it's always going to be more difficult to try and bridge that gap the other way, I think. Um, so that's one thing. And then the other thing is, again, reflecting on my experience with BCA, I have, um, have a, we, we kind of have a network of people who help us. Um, and that network of people are helping us understand how to move uh, that they're almost like the habitats, right? The, the, the kind of movement, the body language, the unspoken, the unspoken modes of communication that work in the establishment world. So we have a resilience project at the moment, and our project mentor is the incredible and lovely Tony Butler, who's the director of Derby Museums. And um, we reflect in our meetings with him that he's almost teaching us how to how to talk and walk like a white man. <laughs> it's really, it's really kind of fascinating. It's like, oh, we actually, um, we actually don't recognize all the time how much of that unspoken language happens. So I know that's not exactly what you're asking, but those are kind of my reflections from, from BCA's experience. There's something about like there is the terminology and the language barriers that don't always work when you're when you're talking from the establishment place to the community place, which have a very authentic and natural viewpoint that needs to be recognized. But there's also something about how, um, how powerful a lot of that unspoken power dynamic actually is. Hmm. So not, yeah, it's not really an answer, but it's some reflections anyway. No, I appreciate. I, I appreciate your answer. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Lorna has a question. Lorna, would you like to ask it? Yeah. Thank you. And, uh, thanks so much for sharing your thoughts. Um, I'm a filmmaker, and I'm embarking on making a film with some archive footage. Um, but I, uh, so I'm, I'm sort of bringing myself up to speed with this whole world of archive. And you mentioned at the beginning. Um, the ARC in Archivist. Can I just ask where that reference is from? <clears throat> Thanks, Lana. So I've, um, I wasn't able to see the chat while I was talking, sorry. So I'm just um, oh. quickly sort of scanning across now and I think a few people have yes, yeah. mentioned it as well. So the word Archon. Archon, okay, thank Archon. you. So you can look at um, Derrida's Archive Fever, which is like an amazing, amazing essay and makes a number of kind of assertions from a philosophical and uh, from a philosophical point of view about how the archon of the archive is, is this uh, seat almost of patriarchal style power and um, how it becomes an authority on history. And so that's something that archivists often kind of push back against because it feels like a misreading of the intention of archives. But it's something that creatives and artists often like identify archives with quite strongly. And I think that, you know, personally for, for much of my career, I've been like, no, that's not what we are. That's not what we are. Yeah. Actually, maybe it's time we start like listening to how other people <laughs> Um, are experiencing us because there must there is some truth in it, even if it's not our intention. That archon idea is still there, but it's also a bit of a Lana. If you ever go to archive conferences, Derrida comes up all the time. So it's almost like a drinking game for archivists to to mention Derrida now. But um, Derrida's archive fever. It's wicked. It's really really interesting. It's uh, I think contentious. I would say. Thanks, and thanks Lisa and Wendy for that as well. Thank you. Okay, uh, Robin's got a question. Robin, would you like to unmute? 
Thank you, and thank you for that really interesting um, talk. I was just wondering, um, do you think community archives help to um, to demystify the archival um, process? Um, and if so, how do you think we as professional archivists can provide support and guidance to these um, community archives without reducing you know, our own significance as a profession? Um, or should we not think of it like that? Should we think of uh, stop, so stop being the gatekeepers? Thanks very much, Robin. I think that's really interesting because that's something that I didn't really touch on, is it? That um, actually archivists can act as gatekeepers to the profession and the practices of the profession itself. I remember when I was at Hull History Centre, um, uh, we had such an interesting dynamic with, um, I can't remember what the, what the local history society was called, but they had their own their own community archive that was the collections are almost in, it felt at the time in the context that I was in then, almost in competition. So we had this like strange kind of dynamic where they were collecting and we were collecting and we were like, well, we know how to look after it. So we should we should be the ones collecting. Um, but you know, they had the the real they had they had a very different approach, um, which is a completely valid approach, actually. Um, so I think that's super interesting to note that archivists, professionally qualified, trained archivists themselves can act as gatekeepers. And I do think that archivists in the UK, at least, I've no idea about other countries at all, no idea, um, can feel quite sensitive about our professional qualifications. Um, the range of skills and work that archivists are called on to do increasingly from being able to do outreach, to be able to curate exhibitions, to understand digital preservation, um, to be able to write articles, to be able to, to, to have some amount of paleography, historiography, um, conservation skills. It's this huge panoply of skills, only some of which are included in the training that we receive at, 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 in, the, in the university archive courses. Um, so I can understand why why archivists in general do do sometimes feel a little bit professionally under attack and as as though the the profession might be being uh, the the sanctity of the professional qualification might be being diluted by paraprofessionals coming in and being able to look after collections. But this has always happened. This has happened in business archives where uh, the business historian probably is the one that, that has been looking after the archive, and it happens in community archives. So yeah. So I can't remember the beginning of your question, Robin, which I think was something about what can, oh, I think it's in the chat, help to demystify the archive and how do we think we as archivists can provide support and guidance. Um, I think it's really difficult for community archives to demystify the archives on, in, in the wider sense because they are not given a platform to do so. So BCA, when, when at the time when it was considered to be a community archive, was completely unable to, to generate um, the, the, the kind of support required to look after its collection and to interpret the collections. It was only after it began behaving as a professional archive that it was able to generate that kind of support. So it's, in, it's incredibly difficult for community archives to demystify the archive. And I think that gives the answer to why, to how professional archivists can provide support and guidance. I think it's not necessarily always providing guidance. I think it might actually be about functioning as that bridge or that platform and helping to amplify those collections and those practices and maybe listening and having more of a dialogue and it doesn't at all um, dilute or, or, or um, deprofessionalize um, professionally qualified archivists because it's a very, very different job and a very different approach. Um, but I think we probably need to be less protectionist as a sector. Okay, we've got time. There are three more questions. So I think we'll, these will be the last three now. So uh, Wendy, would you like to ask your question? Hi, Arika. Thanks for that. Yeah. Great. Um, so I just wanted to, you mentioned be, uh, being an activist archivist earlier. And um, I just wanted to say something about, uh, you know, what I myself working in an institution which always has a certain kind of, you know, historical narrative and even when it diverse 
diversifies, and I put that in quotations, um, it still maintains what it is. Um, and we all know that this is what, you know, institutions seek to preserve themselves. So, I'm, and I mean, as an artist, I'm increasingly feeling like I have to act against the institution in order to somehow save it. Um, so I just wondered, you know, there is always this struggle, therefore, that archivists who want to change have, because in a sense, they're having this constant battle with the institution that they're in, that wants to kind of, you know, go by the standards, go by this, go by that, and so on. So I just wondered if you had any kind of comments on that in relation to what you were saying about activism. Sure, thank you. Thanks, Wendy. Um, it's going to be really diff different depending on the context, isn't it? So if you're the activist, uh, you know, um, Glaxo Smith Klein, for example, um, there's not going to be much that you can do, I would imagine, because um, you're very much within a within uh, business sensitivities. So when I worked at Welcome, um, Glaxo Smith Klein had bought the Welcome Pharmaceutical Company, and so some of Welcome's institutional records are at Glaxo Smith Klein's archive. Um, and not able to be released back to welcome because they have still um, some patents in them. So that's where that reference comes from. So I'm just saying that it really kind of depends in some ways on the institution and it depends on the type of radicalism that you're kind of talking about, I suppose. I think there are always small moves that can be made. And um, if we're talking about progress and resilience, um, there's something that my mentor said to me um, because I, uh, as part of my role at BCA, um, have a role on a government advisory group. And he said, you don't always have to convince everyone in the room about what's right. You just have to convince them about what's going to work. And then they'll agree with you. And that's how you can uh, that's how you can you can turn that situation. Uh, my mentor in this case, Dr. Nick Winter Botham, was one of the people who um, convinced the government to put Holocaust back on the curriculum at the time when he was in meetings with them. It had been taken off the curriculum. Um, so he's pretty amazing. But I think that there's just there's just something quite key in there. And um, bear in mind that everyone's situation is going to be so different. I think that maybe that small kernel, you don't necessarily have to convince them that it's the right thing to do. To do. You just have to convince them that, that, that this is what's going to work. And that essentially is, you know, what I'm really talking about, that for the purposes of a socially useful and socially beneficial function of an archivist, then I think what works is a civic archivist approach. And it doesn't have to be a moral argument or even a radical argument. It's like, if this is the, the outcome that we want, then this is what's going to work. And I think you can frame, you can frame things in that way. Um, and I think it does also feed into what, you know, Robin was, was um, kind of inferring and, and, uh, and referring to around the kind of the sort of anxiety and the protectionism around change um, and threats to the, the perceived professionalism. You know, of course, at BCA, um, having fought for so long to be to have that level of professionalism and recognition, um, it would be really foolish of us to to sort of throw it all out and say, right, we're not going to follow any professional standards anymore. Of course, we can't because there's such a reputational risk involved. But I think that we can start to question and move and nudge and um, use our platform to try and influence change. So I hope that's helpful. Okay, thank you. Oh. Gillian, you're muted, I'm afraid. Okay, so the next question is Eve Anthea. You there? Can you unmute yourself? No. What about Anne Lee? Hello. Oh, she's there. Okay, do you want to ask your question? Well, it, um, I've got two questions, but I'll just choose the one. 
Um, yeah, I think the, the more exciting one for me is um, with the, you know, everything's digital, we've got the um, information so at our fingertips. How do the a traditional archivist deal with a fake news, fake information, or information that has to be amended, um, especially with, you know, with cultural um, archives that something might come to light and it will be agreed that, that the, the information that you have is no longer valid or it may need removing. But most of all, I what what um what kills me is we have more information at our fingertips than ever before, but we are less likely to actually want to actually question it or to actually research it because it's there in front of you and people believe it. Yeah, I think this is super interesting because um it sort of goes down to like the the core of of why we bother cataloging in the first place right because otherwise it's just this you know piles and piles and piles and piles of information with no no possible route through it's white noise right without without the radio station being tuned in um and so you know it's it's a bit of a um you know something that's been talked about over and over again you know this idea of archivists having a role in in interpreting but um, certainly archivists have a role in framing and how information is presented. Um, and so when we're talking about things like fake news, then that shouldn't, if it has research value, which is, you know, this idea of having to be a therapist to the future and figuring out what we're going to need in the future, then there shouldn't be something that's purged from the archival record. It just has to be framed. It has to be framed. It has to have the metadata that goes with it but it's it's still not the archivist's role to say this is true and this isn't it's the archivist's role to say this is and this is how this came up this is this is the framework in which it came about and we're always going to have to make decisions about you know what what isn't included that's something around appraisal theory we do have to make decisions about what isn't included and i think that's you know I, I suppose if you're thinking about you know social media and the fake news on social media it's it's something about do we do we start to have a discursive approach to how we use hashtags in metadata for example and i mean the original hashtags that might be on something if like stop the count hashtag stop the count or whatever is on something does that mean that that then becomes part of the descriptive framework that we use when we're cataloging it so that people are able to sift it through and that's one of the reasons why i find the john latham quite interesting because it gives us different ways to kind of sift through but in terms of like purging something from the archival narrative because it's not true, that's not, I don't think that, that I don't think that should be part of archival practice. Like information, information about the information, so the data and the metadata is I think what's gonna be super, super important for us to pay a lot of attention to. Um, but yeah. I mean, slightly further um, on from that is, 50 years ago, 30 years ago, there were very few or very little black minority or ethnic archivists working. So when you do come to a new archive or when you do take on a job as an archivist from, uh, you know, if, if you are a black person um, and you are constantly coming across information that is steeped in, you know, I can't think the word racism, but racist rhetoric, um, colonial rhetoric, um, items in an archive that have been kept, you know, but no one items that really should have been kept and not been kept. It's a big job. It's a heck of a job for um, a new um, conscious thinking archivist to go into an established, um, you know, organisation and try and get some pleasure out of it because I mean similarly I used to work in um, the, the BBC in diversity and that was one person a group of people taking on a massive organization to try and um, change the output of diversity across regions and nations and it became a job that 
looked lovely on paper, but actually became such a political, stressful hotbed that you were up against it. You had to be really strong. You had to be forthright and you had to triple and double, triple check everything that you actually gave to the organization because it was coming from this troublemaker or this person who wanted to change. I'm really sorry that happened and I absolutely recognize that experience. It's, it feels like another one of those tale as old as time, right? The organizations bring in a diversity and inclusion person or a diversity and inclusion team and then that is the box in which all of the emotional labor and all of the work is supposed to happen to fix everything that's actually endemic across all levels and it's 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 an absolutely impossible position to be put in and 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 can actually really really damage your your own emotional spiritual physical and mental health so i'm really sorry that that, that, you, that you went through that and i'm thinking as well about when i was a um welcome so loved working at welcome massively recommend to anyone to work at welcome it's brilliant so henry welcome uh, a globe trotting philanthropist pharmacist um and exoticist so he deliberately was collecting uh collections to do the history of medicine believing that medicine is uh linked to anthropology and so there's lots and lots of um auction catalogues from I guess the 1920s I forget now I'm terrible with dates I think it's the 1920s auction catalogues that Welcome and his agents would have gone to um, to buy materials for the collections and the descriptions in those catalogues which you know there's no well that's probably a trigger warning now but as a as an archival worker behind the scenes looking through these these um catalogues to see to do some provenance research it suddenly kind of faced with um, descriptions of how items were collected from massacres and how items were collected from punitive expeditions and how items, you know, uh, would uh, trophies of not war, but just trophies of, of, um, of, of looting and theft. And these descriptions are quite lurid in these catalogues because, you know, for the auction house, for the mood of the time of the people who were going to the auction house, it makes them sound like more exciting and more valuable. But then when you're an archival worker and you're going through and you're like, oh, I just want to know where Henry Welcome got this um, recipe book or whatever from. Oh, God. Right. So it's, it's, there's, there, there needs to be something that we consider. And it might not be something that our employers are always awake to considering. But as a network of archival workers, I think there's something we need to consider around how we support each other and how we take into account that kind of very triggering material. And I give like a very specific example, but obviously if you're working in a hospital or what have you, then and there are other types of very triggering material. At Birmingham Archives, there were um, there was material of like um, post-mortems, you know, and, and things like that. So there's all sorts of incredibly upsetting material in there. Yeah, we've just got to be, you know, we've got to actually be, a certain person takes on that job. You don't realise until you're in the job why you were chosen. You, obviously, they, they see something in you, but they expect so much, and often the support isn't there. They've ticked their box, and now you've got to stay in your box but still you've got to actually throw things out the box, what they like. It, it, I mean, I, did, I, I take my hat off to you. you. You're doing a fabulous, fabulous job. Thanks, sis. Okay. <laughs> okay, we've got time for one last question and it's from Anne Lee. Just a practical question, really. Um, does open access to archives mean having sources all available in digital form? It, it can do. That's very expensive, though. So it will always uh, to, to answer practically and frankly, with apologies, Anne, it will always depend on the resources of the institution. Mm -hmm. But um, not not all archives are going to be able to do open access because not all archives will have the permission from the creators of the documents or some things might be in copyright and stuff. Uh, you know that that kind of issue so there are some practical 
uh, barriers that are, that are nothing to do with philosophy, but just some practical barriers um, to having everything open access. I would imagine that that would be ultimately a very, very accessible way for everything to be uh, to be presented, you know, because people from all over the world, any time of day or night or time zone should be able to access digital material should they be in a, in, in a position to have an, uh, a device that can access the internet and access to the internet, which, you know, as we know, is not 100% across across the global community. But yeah, sorry, kind of a practical answer to a practical question. In theory, yes. Uh, aside from those uh, uh, practical considerations, there's the question of how to priori prioritize what you, what you digitize as well. Mm -hmm. But yeah, again, maybe there can be practical applications to that because you know some of the some of the things that you take into account when you are prioritizing what to digitize are its condition, the demand for it, the quality of the catalog, the quality of the data so that people can find it, whether you can look after the digital object that's created from the digitization, and whether you have something that people a platform that people can actually you know usefully used you know it's not all of that white noise so those are some of the things that you would just practically look at for prioritizing and then you might look at um more kind of psychosocial reasons so is this important is it timely now so in the summer slightly different thing but in the summer for bca even though we were still in the full full lockdown we sent out a call out to collect digital Black Lives Matter documentation, um, which we had a great response to. And obviously we were only able to collect it digitally. So, you know, is it timely? You know, it, depending on your approach, what is the social function of it? What's the research value? And then, you know, some of the other more practical, probably more boring considerations to take into account as well. Thank you, that's helpful. Thank you. Okay, that's all we have time for now. And um, thank you all very much for coming tonight. And join me in thanking our speaker. So I'm just going to clap for you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so well, much. And I just, I just want to say that I haven't been able to read the chats really at all. So I'm so sorry. I think there's probably some messages to me in there. Um, I apologize. Yeah, I, I think haven't. we can copy, we can save that, can't we, Debbie? Can we save the chat? Yeah, I can. I'll save the chat because I'm recording it. Um, there was a question from Gregory, so I'll, Erica, I'll make sure that I email it to you both tomorrow. And um, maybe, actually, Gregory, if you want to put your email in there, then um, she can get back to you, like, kind of, like, directly, if that makes sense. So, yeah. Thank okay. you so much. Okay, okay thank, thank you. I'm just people are still making comments so feel free to make some comments and I'll just give it a couple of minutes before um before I turn it off if that makes sense because otherwise I won't record your comments or chat Okay, so just to give everybody just a last chance to write any comments or put any direct emails in if you want a direct response, because I'll record the chat and um, send it to Erika and Julian tomorrow. <laughs>
Okay, thanks all. I'm going to end the meeting now. Oh, I'll let that person just put in their email before I end it. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, I'll, set, I'll fin finish the meeting now. Thanks everybody for coming.